live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode Port Marshal. Um, so basically, the Enterprise has experienced an ion storm during which they have lost command, uh, Lieutenant Commander Ben Finney, Kirk's old friend, um, who was an instructor at the Academy. Uh, when Kirk was there, um, Kirk fills out his report. Spock brings in the library tapes and uh, the Admiral, whose name I can't remember. Um, I can't, yeah, I can't remember. Uh, the Admiral in command of this starbase is like Kirk. You have committed perjury because this this video recording made automatically by the computer shows that you jettisoned the pod before going to red alert rather than after, which was the proper procedure. And so Kirk is like, that is not what happened. So they have a trial. Um, and basically Kirk is on trial to determine whether or not he... Because what he had to do was go to yellow alert Warn Ben Finney, who was in the the ion pod, that he was potentially going to have to jettison it. Then Kirk would have to go to red alert, give Ben Finney the the amount of time required by the regulations before he could jettison the pod. Which is what Kirk did, or thought he did. The problem is the computer's record tapes made automatically at the time, show that Kirk went to yellow alert, then jettisoned the pod, then pressed the red alert button. So you have Kirk asserting one thing, you have the computer asserting the opposite thing. And so that's, that's the basis of this trial. Kirk's crew, generally speaking, stands behind him. Spock asserts that Given the captain's nature, he could not have done things the way that the computer says he did them. McCoy asserts the same thing, but the video shows that that's what happened. So that's the big challenge Kirk and his lawyer, Samuel T. Cogley, attorney at law, face. What, um, what they figure out, or more specifically what Spock figures out, is that the computer has been altered. So Spock, ha Spock had programmed the computer to play chess. He programmed it with all of his knowledge of chess 
And so, in principle, he should never be able to actually beat the computer at chess. The best he should be able to do is get a draw. But he beats the computer at chess five times in a row, which tells Spock that somebody has altered the computer. Now, the people who would have the knowledge to do that are Kirk, who presumably would not frame himself for murder, Spock, who would not frame the captain for murder, and if he did, it would be an incredibly bad strategy to then be like, somebody messed with the computer. Or the records officer of the ship, Ben Finney. And so, what Samuel T. Cogley, attorney at law, plus Kirk and Spock figure out is that, logically, Ben Finney did not die. He, he survived, hid out on the Enterprise, altered the record tapes to frame Kirk for, basically, for murder. Because earlier in his career, Kirk had relieved Finney of, of duty and found a switch open that would have blown up the ship if it had not been closed. Kirk closed the switch and logged the incident, and that black mark on Finney's record uh, at least contributed to him not getting promoted as fast as he otherwise might have. So Finney, it turned out, blamed Kirk for uh, for the, the stunting of his own career, and he tries to frame Kirk and then destroy the Enterprise. Kirk essentially finds Finney, beats him up, undoes the damage that Finney had done, um, and then all charges against Kirk are dropped. Finney is charged with we don't know what, and then at the end we, we learn that Samuel T. Cogwell, attorney at law, is defending Finney. Um, the other element that I didn't really mention in terms of the, the plot summary, but that's worth noting, is that the prosecuting attorney from the, the Judge Advocate General's office is Kirk, one of one of one of one of one of many uh, of Kirk's old girlfriends. So there's that personal tension as well, that professional tension on her part between I really don't want to convict Kirk, but my job is to do so, etc., etc. So we've got all those things. Now, before I talk about the social justice element, there's, I want to I want to talk a bit about Samuel T. Cogwell, attorney at law. In my video about the Squire of Gothos, I said that Trelane and um, Cyrano Jones from The Trouble with Tribbles are probably my two favorite guest characters, non-recurring, non non-crew non non members. I forgot about Samuel T. Cogwell, attorney at law. He is one of the best characters in the entirety of the show. Um, He's an eccentric, and I love that about him. He's a books person, and I love that about him. He's a humanist, and I love that about him. Kirk, so Kirk, after uh, his old girlfriend, um, whose name I can't remember either, um, Alea, something like that? I don't remember. I'm, just, I'm not really remembering many of the names from this episode, except Samuel T. Cogwell, attorney at law. So, uh, the girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, prosecuting attorney, recommends Cogwell as Kirk's attorney. Kirk goes back to his uh, quarters on this starbase, and he finds it just full of books. And this dude who's sitting just writing on an old-school notepad, not the sort of little, like, digital clipboard that they, they regularly use, like, pen and paper. And he's just filled Kirk's apartment with books. Um, and Kirk's like, why, first off, why are you here? Second off, why do you have all these books? And Cogwell is like, I have, and, and Cogwell is like, books have all the knowledge. And Kirk's like, so does the computer. And he's like, yeah, I have a computer. I never turn it on. If you want to actually know the law, if you want to know the Code of Hammurabi, 
the statutes of the Martian colonies, Magna Carta, books is where they are. And I love that. I love that element of it. Uh, because I'm a books person. I mean, I, you can see even here, I've got a stuff. If I, sh I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I've got twelve stacks of books over on that side of, of my office here. Um, I've got four, four more stacks of books over there. I've got one, two, three, four, four totes of books just in my this is not a big office too i'll tell you i'll tell you that this is a fairly smallish space and i've got a ton of books so i am i am samuel t conquell attorney at law in that sense um though uh as a as a contingent english instructor i'm certainly not making lawyer money but so he loves books. He's a books guy. He's not a computers guy. I'm a computers guy too. I like computers, but I like books. Um, but then during also the trial, he makes this great humanist argument that the rights of a person must exceed the rights of a computer. And the computer is the primary witness against Kirk. And Kirk has been denied the right to confront the computer, denied the right to confront his accuser. And so Cogwell makes this great speech. Um, I can't remember exactly what it is, but he, he's like, um, I respectfully request that this court be adjourned and reconvene on the Enterprise and what's more, in the name of humanity being overshadowed by the machine, I demand it. So he's a humanist. He believes in the value of humanity. He believes in justice. He believes in, in, in an ideal version of the law. And I think those are, I think that's beautiful. I think he's a, he's a wonderful character and I really like him. Um, that being said, so the big, social justice issue here is, of course, about the legal system, the propensity to con convict those who are innocent is a huge, huge problem. Now, in principle, in the U.S., for instance, we have the presumption of innocence. That is, guilt must be established beyond a reasonable doubt. The problem is, as groups like the Innocence Project and scholars, advocates like Brian Stevenson, for instance, have provided a massive body of evidence, innocent people are convicted regularly, particularly people of color, people who are uh, without financial means, people who have um, mental or cognitive disabilities, because these people either lack the resources to mount a confident defense, they are seen by juries as not credible or as inclined to criminality, um, or they simply have the deck stacked against them in some way. And so this is a big, big problem. I mean, Kirk comes very, very close to being convicted. Like Spock, like literally... Cogwell has state has said the defense rests when Kirk when Spock and McCoy burst into the courtroom and they're like, wait, we've got more evidence that exonerates the captain. If they had been 10 minutes later, like if Cogwell had rested his case and the court had been like, well, that's that, Kirk would have been convicted. He was innocent, but he would have been convicted. And so this is a big issue, particularly in the U.S., particularly right now in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, the prison abolition movement, etc., etc., because it is very, very common. Like, the U.S. has the largest incarcerated population in the world, I believe both in real numbers and per capita. We have, we just, we imprison massive amounts of our own people. And that includes 
formal prison, but that also includes parole, that includes um, house arrest, that includes all of these different things. And because of the way that our prison system functions, we're not really interested in rehabilitation. Uh, we, we generally see prison as punishment. So this is retributive justice rather than rehabilitative justice. That is, the goal is to penalize someone who has committed a crime rather than to um, rather than to heal them in a way, like rather than to to create the conditions in which they can return to being a productive member of society. And so we have like there's a ton there's a ton of issues surrounding the justice system, the prison system, um, the conviction of the in innocent, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the United States as well as other countries. Um, these issues exist in the UK, they exist in Canada, they exist in uh, a ton of different countries. I'm most familiar with the US context because I happen to be an American. Um, but these are big, big issues. And I don't really, I don't have the time in this video or the expertise really to talk about them in as much detail as they should be. But um, look into the Innocence Project, look into Brian Stevenson. These people are doing fantastic work about the problems with the justice system and how it fails to live up to the ideal of justice in many, many, many cases. The other um, thing that I, I note noted as I rewatched this episode, the other thing that I think is really interesting is the first off, we have a black com commander of the Starbase, Admiral, uh, his name I can't remember, um, but we, he's African, African American, we don't know. Um, I think the actor is African American, but Michelle Nichols, who plays Uhura, is African American, but I think the character, I think, is from Kenya. So it is what it is. Um, Swahili is her native language. We do find that out later on. But uh, so we have a we have a, a black commander of the starbase, and then on the on the the court martial tri uh, tribunal who runs Kirk's. Uh, criminal case. We have that guy, two white guys, and then we have an Indian guy. So even though they're all male, so we don't have gender equity here necessarily, we do have a racially diverse set of top-ranking Starfleet officers. Like These are people who were chosen to be on this committee because they rank higher than Kirk does. So we have a, a fairly ethnically diverse group there, which is really, really good in terms of representation, in terms of putting people of color into high-ranking positions within the the Starfleet, within the, the Star Trek worldview. And, of course, the prosecuting attorney who, I mean, her rank is lower than Kirk's. I think she's a lieutenant, but she is the lead prosecuting attorney for the Judge Advocate General's office, at least on this star base. And she's female. So we do, in that sense, have, again, high-ranking female officials who are uh, playing important, important roles within Starfleet. 